Hi everybody, it's an honor to be here today and be presenting in front of you. So I'm going to talk about how science is in our world and how I got inspired into science and hopefully inspire some more of you to get interested into STEM. So science has always been a passion of mine. So um, ever since I was little, I say I was born with goggles and a beaker in hand because I really have had an interest since very young. In kindergarten, I during show and tell time, I would uh, bring in like a rock collection or something that I had and always do a scientific presentation. So I've been presenting for a majority of my life. I started doing science fairs when I was in third grade and I've done them ever since. And I'm a six time Indiana State Science Fair winner and a two time Indiana Top Young Scientist. So I'm actually from Northwest Indiana. Um, I came here today to talk to you, so I'm really excited about that. So um, getting interested in science. So some of you may be interested in it really a lot right now. Some of you may not. But really, I encourage you to get interested into it, because at some point in your life, you are going to have some interest in it. Now, I don't want you to think, though, that it has to be structured by the school or that you have to be interested by the school because I got interested totally independently. We had a club formed by our school by some parents, and I got interested in doing science fairs that way. There's no, you can motivate yourself to get interested into it. So uh, I, what I have kind of like a rule that I follow by whenever you're doing a science fair project or any research project is to try and solve a problem that impacts people and or is important to someone that you know or to your own life. So I always try and make some impact that way. And for example, um, one of my projects, I redesigned uh, drywall. And it was after I saw the next door neighbors struggling to haul and maneuver drywall into their house. So it's just things that I see that I try to improve and try to make a difference on in the world. So don't be afraid to try and fail. Because really, failing can never exist if you keep on trying and trying. Because if you keep persevering and if you have dedication, you're going to have more successes in life. So one thing I want to talk about is the difference between an activity versus an experiment versus research, because that's something that some people get a little confused about, because there is a difference when doing a scientific uh, research project versus doing a class activity. So they're all good. They all have benefits, but there are just some differences. So first of all, an activity is going to be short. It's going to be fast. It's going to be a demo. It's going to be a good visual. It's going to help people be able to teach a lesson. So like a teacher is going to use it in a classroom. But it's something that you're not really going to go super in depth about, but it's going to get the point across. With a experiment, it's going to be more in depth measurement. So you're going to be paying attention to having more trials and having more uh, changing variables. You're going to have like a control that you're going to have and different things like that, that you're not necessarily going to have in an activity. And then research is building on that, where you're going to have multiple experiments, and you're going to have multiple trials, even more so than before. And you're also going to include more so about your background research that you've done. So any research papers that you read is going to be included in your literature research, which I recommend to use Google Scholar. Google Scholar, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a really nice resource that you are able to use to find research papers, to find um, any really document out there about research so you know if, let's say, you come up with an idea so you know if it's already out there or not. So it's really a good resource to use. So my question is, what's your question if you do do a science fair project? So the, if you do an activity there, and versus research, there are two different ways of formulating the question. So for an activity, you're going to say more so of like a can question. It's going to answer a yes or no question. So it's going to be, for example, I have for plants as an example, can watering a plant three times a day kill it? So you see that you're going to have a yes or a no answer. And the same as if I water a plant three times a day, will I kill it? So an if will statement is like another type of question. Nothing to do with an if-then statement. If-then with hypotheses, that's great. That's like with research. But with an activity, an if-will statement can sometimes help in determining a yes or no answer that way. With research, it's going to be more so you're asking why, you're asking how, you're asking more in-depth questions. So it's going to be like, what effect will watering a plant three times a day have on its growth? So it's going to be something that you're able to analyze and get more data about versus an activity where you're not necessarily going to have that. So there are many, you might be wondering, what are the benefits to doing a science fair project? So there are multiple benefits. So first of all, it improves your public speaking skills. I definitely feel, know multiple people that it has improved their public speaking skills with um, because they get to talk to more people, talk in front of groups of people, and it just improves in general. 
Secondly, problem solving skills. Even being here today at the Computer History Museum, you gained tons of problem solving skills, tons of brainstorming and collaboration skills, and you can gain more of that as well when doing science re scientific research. Also, it boosts your confidence level. So some people may, especially this relates to public speaking, some people may not have a comfort speaking in public, but then once they do it once in a while, do it more so through a science fair, they have a higher confidence level when knowing, hey, I can actually do this, I can speak in front of a large group of people and feel confident about it. Also, it improves research skills and scientific knowledge. So there are multiple benefits to this. So my scientific research throughout the years has really varied, and it's been a huge scheme of topics. So I, majority of these topics, I had no previous knowledge at all about any of it. So it shows that you can get into any field you want. So don't feel limited like, oh, I don't know a lot about that topic. I really shouldn't go into it. Because if you just do research about it, you can do any topic that you want. So for example, in third grade, I decided to find a way to develop my own vacuum packing system. So I tried to slow down the decomposition of food. Um, then in fourth grade, I designed a food can for stacking and packing and for efficiency. And I got this inspiration from when I was in the grocery store. I saw someone struggling to pack cylindrical cans, and they were falling all over the floor. So I decided that there must be some way to help. And then the drywall example that I explained earlier, and then my most recent one, which I'm going to explain soon, that I built on, was designing a microwavable container that cooks food quickly. But more recently, my microwave oven scientific research. So this is my research. I'm very proud of it. It's gone really far. Um, national competitions and to the White House and different places like that. So it was a two and a half year investigation um, that uh, analyzed optimum microwave oven parameters. So how many of you here have tried to warm up a frozen food meal in the microwave oven and the inside of your dish is cold with ice slivers in it but the outer perimeter is warm? Thank you. <laughs> That's my exact problem that I ran into multiple times and I decided that there must be some way to fix it. So I decided to set off in finding where majority of the energy was distributed throughout the microwave oven, and I found that more so of the energy was in the outer perimeter of the turntable and even past that in the corners of the microwave oven. And this trapped energy, I thought that it must be a more practical solution to try to reflect that lost energy in the corners toward the center of the food and toward the uncooked part of the food to heat the food more evenly, more uniformly, and also as well save energy. So. I call this, uh, I'm uh, basically proposing that industry should change the microwave oven cavity design to more of a rounded rectangle or a rectolip shape, as you can see in these pictures. And this shows that it's really more so an energy efficient way to cook the food as well as uniformly. So the top two pictures up there were actually made on Autodesk Inventor. And I learned that through a program, I'm not sure if your school has it or not, it's called Project Lead the Way or PLTW, and it's an applied science curriculum, and one of their classes is Introduction to Engineering Design. And in that class, really the class was strictly on learning Autodesk Inventor and using that. And it really helped me tremendously in building my microwave cavity design because it shows that anything you have in your head, anything that you think of, you're able to build. So here is a 3D print of it. So they have multiple websites out there. I think the one I use is Shapeways. And what you can do is send in your design, and they will 3D print it and send it back, because I don't have a 3D printer at home. And that's a really convenient way to see if it actually worked or not. So some benefits of, we talked about benefits of a science for project, but not necessarily STEM knowledge. So STEM knowledge can take you so many places. I'm going to describe a few places where it's taken me. So. You can win awards for your accomplishments. I actually stood in October on this very same stage um, with the Broadcom Masters competition. And it's a national middle school science competition that they pick the top 30 middle school science students in the nation. And we go and compete. And last year, it was here at the Computer History Museum. So you can win awards for your accomplishments. That's just one of the examples. But you also get to meet and network with students who share a passion for science. So you even experienced that here today. You definitely met and networked with so many individuals who volunteered, individuals who were also interested in STEM and interested in programming. And they're here, and they also share a passion for science. And you were able to network with people here. Also, there's STEM at the White House. So um, I, with the Broadcom Masters group, usually with um, the organization in the past, they've gotten to go to the White House and meet the president. So. 
Um, in 2014, we were able to go there and um, we were invited to the White House and um, the President said a few words to us. But also, more recently, um, at the White House Science Fair, I uh, attended, it was in April sometime this year, and there were so many different scientists there that you can network with. So, for example, they had people from their U.S. patent office there that I was able to work with because I currently have a provisional patent on my microwave cavity design. And also, I was able to work with just so many people there, network engineers that really launched and would tell me critique and help in developing more so of my scientific research information. So for example, also Bill Nye the Science Guy was there. So I got, to got, I got a selfie with Bill Nye, which is a pretty awesome feeling to do that. So then also, here's some more pictures. So you get to present in front of people, like I was explaining before. But also, you get to meet celebrities. So I don't know if you've heard of her or not, but her name is Carly Kloss. And she is a model who is into coding. She currently encourages girls in coding, which is a big thing the US is encouraging right now. And you get to meet people like that to encourage you to keep going in science, keep going in STEM. So also, another thing was um, if you have STEM knowledge and go to some of these competitions, you get to discuss STEM with your state top educational leaders. So uh, I also got to talk with, since I'm from Indiana, the Indiana Superintendent of Public Instruction. And she came to my school. She'd never been to my school. She came there for the first time, and I was able to give her a tour. And it was really a nice honor for her. She was interested in the curriculum that we had, interested in my research, and it was really a nice feeling to that my research got that far to even to her to consider coming to the school. But also I get to share my some knowledge and excitement with others, which is what I why I enjoy doing this presentation so much today. But also this was at an international competition and just when you're able when you do your research and you're passionate about it, you really want to present to and tell other people about it. So it's a great feeling. So don't be afraid to take risks and explore science because soon you'll be soaring. So these are just examples of soaring. Um, so <laughs> I, was, I went indoor skydiving, uh, zip lining, and parasailing, and obviously all include science, so that's great. But um, it really is just showing that don't be afraid to take risks, because really there's, there are endless possibilities out there in different things that you can do. And it's a great feeling to be able to do that research and share it with other people and actually make an impact on people's lives and pe on the environment. So resources. So to parents, moms, happy Mother's Day. Um, so for some resources, so for example, the Society for Science in the Public is a nonprofit organization that sponsors three main science uh, competitions out there. And the three are the Broadcom Masters, which is for middle school level. Um, and you have to be nominated by some science fair, regional, state, either one. Um, Intel ISEP, which is a high school STEM competition, so that's grades 9 through 12, so you must have, you have to be nominated by either your regional or state for that as well. And then Intel STS, which is the high school senior STEM competition, which is for grade 12, and that's a direct student application. So that, comp that one is, you just send it in online, they pick from there, you don't have to be picked by any science fair at all. Then also Project Lead the Way, like I was talking about earlier, great resource. They have so many different applied science curricula there, and especially if your school has it, that's great. And also the Computer History Museum, that's a huge resource for you. I mean, you live right by this great museum that has programs like Design Code Build and other programs like that, and has so many resources that can help you go far in STEM. And there are just many more out there. Just use the internet. There's so many out there if you really have an interest in it. And you can just Google STEM competitions, and you'll find so many more. So in conclusion, if you really don't know where to start, just look at the world around you. Look at different problems that you have and think of something, some way that you can make it better or improve something and make a difference on the world. And you can be the change that we want to see in this world, which is a quote from Gandhi, if you never stop challenging yourself to use your talents and skills to impact positive changes on our society. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. So yeah, I think um, if you can stay up on stage yeah. and answer a few okay. questions, that'd be great. I think probably uh, many of our moms and students might have questions for you, um, whether it's how do I get involved in that kind of thing, or how cool was Bill Nye? <laughs> um, any questions? Any questions for Annie? Sure. How many competitions have you been in? How many have I been in? Okay, so that's a, a lot. Um, 
Uh, I've been, I started in third grade, so the thing is when you get older, there are more that you can get into. So like third through fifth grade, like elementary school, they really don't have a lot. So that was more so regional and state, but then in middle school, they had the national competition and I went to the White House. Um, I went to Broadcom three times, so that like, so just things like that, really. I mean, it's, I don't know how many exactly, but it's been a lot. Been busy, but yeah. <laughs> So when you um, were experimenting with your microwave, um, what kind of tools did you use to measure the energy where? Yeah. Good question. So I used an infrared camera or an IR camera to do this. So the camera that I had had an online program that um, had where you could use like a pixel amount and when you, uh, you could drag like to a certain, I used marshmallows to test it to like see like visual but also to have a good wide range of like food that was able in there. So using the infrared camera, it could take the individual temperature of each marshmallow and I took like start and final temperatures and then took the change. So that's the way that I did it with there. But also using marshmallows was a pretty good visual and also delicious. But um, that and works, but yeah, so. I have a following question. So do you have somebody to uh, help you with uh, these things when you have questions around them, or do you always do the research yourself? Uh, I've done, uh, that's another thing. So I've done science fair projects. All of mine have been at home. So majority of my things have been with like home resources that you're going to find around the house. So like my drywall was with like poster board and like using paper as a honeycomb structure. So it's things like that around the house that I use. But because um, you don't necessarily have to work with the university to do it. So there, there are ways that you can do it at home and do it. So really, I haven't had any like university guidance at all. With, awesome. So. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so you built the microwave thing that could easily heat up things completely or um, more uniformly. But what else have you built? So uh, that was the one slide that I had that um, I built a new vacuum packing system, like kind of like a homemade sample that was a long time ago. Fourth grade, I had a new can that you could uh, use in like stores that's easier for stacking and packing. Fifth grade was a new drywall design that was strong but lighter than it is now, so it's easier for hauling, maneuvering, and installing in like houses. Then uh, sixth grade was my microwave container. So it was basically a container design that cooked food more efficiently. And then seventh grade was where I built on the microwave research. And I'm kind of still continuing with that right now. So. OK, and another question. Um, what do you plan to build in the future? I mean, that's depending upon whatever I see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a thing, OK, if I see something, I kind of have a list of things like that I observe, and then whatever one appeals to me most, and I go off of that. So really, it's anything that I'll see right now that I'll be like, OK, you know what? That's something that i got to solve, problem I want to fix, and I'll go from there. So. Here we go. Uh, how long do you spend on these projects? Well, it, I do it in majority of my spare time. So whenever I have the time to do it, either it's like doing a little more reading, a little more research, or something like that. Um, it's, I mean, you, you get pretty dedicated to it when you get, like when I got interested in it, I just kept going and going and going and going. Because when I first found that the energy, like for the microwave one, was in the corners, then I got, I realized, OK, you know what? Let me keep going with that. and then. I, my first design wasn't to make the microwave with like a rounded edges. I mean, I had designs where I was trying to make it cylindrical and that didn't work. I had designs where I had like reflectors in the corner that were only like really small so it didn't work. I mean, I, there are multiple designs and with the engineering design process, it's really whenever I had uh, spare time. So usually on weekends and sometimes after school that I would work on it. So, and in the summer a lot, a lot too. Um, how often did you work with other passionate STEM students? So, um, for example, in school, my school does a lot of group work. So every single day in my engineering class, we like work in groups all the time. But 
Um, there are other things like, for example, in Broadcom, like we worked in teams the whole week. So it's really a lot of team building activities there. And really, majority of these competitions that are out there have some team aspect to it. So I work in teams a lot because it's a really easy way to get things done. And it's just a good way to brainstorm, so things like that. So. Over here, Eddie. Hi. Um, did you use your home microwave, or did you have a dedicated microwave for your testing? Well, um, I use my home microwave, but it, it's, it's, yeah, it's really any microwave that I used. I used kind of a general size, not like a, not a super tiny one, not super big, so it was kind of like a medium size. It was, yeah, so. First, I want to thank you for coming here and presenting. And kids learn a lot, and we also learned. And I want to know what spark, uh, yet how you got interested. So in I got interested when, I mean, when I was little, I would do like kitchen chemistry or like analyze like rock collections and different things like that. And then in third grade, we had a group of parents that started a science club. And a bunch of kids joined. It was like for third through fifth grade and at my elementary school. And we all were doing projects, doing different research. And some of us decided, you know what, let's try and enter this into an actual competition. So we entered it into our regional science fair. And from there, I advanced to state. And then that's where I won first. And ever since then, it's just kept going with competitions. So. Yep, here we go. What was Bill Nye like? <laughs> Bill and I was, he was a really a funny guy. Um, he really, you could tell he was passionate about science and about climate change, so I think that's one of the reasons why he came to mind was because I, like, saving energy is, like, a big thing he's passionate about. And he's really personable. Like, he's, like, really anxious to get to talk to students. He just, like, walked around. Like, I saw him at the White House, and he just walked around all the projects and just seemed, like, in shock. I actually got filmed by him and for some, one of his documentaries. Apparently, it's coming out in two years, I think, something like that. So it was pretty neat to be able to talk to him. So, yeah. All right, in the back, Andy. How did you improve upon um, drywall? Oh, okay. So that I, so you know how drywall has that gypsum layer. So it's two layers with an inner core of gypsum. So I decided to replace the gypsum. So I used. Like, again, it was like a prototype at home since it was all done at home. So I used, in place of the two layers, I had poster board. And then for an inner layer, it was a honeycomb structure that was paper. And this was, I kind of did a ratio to compare, like, how much weight it should hold compared to what the drywall was then. And I found that it was able to support a great amount of weight that you wouldn't expect for just paper. So that was the way that I, I basically replaced the gypsum, the heavier part of the material. So. All right, I think we have time for just two more questions. So one here, and then over there. All right, so once you're done with high school, what do you plan on majoring in college? Well, um, at the moment, I'm more so interested in engineering, so probably some engineering field. I don't know if like biomedical engineering, electrical engineering. I mean, I don't know really what field, but I do like to, any, definitely in science, but at the moment, I'm looking more so into engineering, so. All righty, last one in the front. Um, did you broke any microwaves while you try to do your test? No, no. It, well, definitely, there's, you know how sometimes you have that spark in the microwave? Yeah, so I did experience that a few times with uh, some older designs. Like in the, That's just what you have in the engineering design process, you know, safety first. But um, yeah, so I did experience some arcing once in a while. But um, other than that, no microwave broken, no, nothing dangerous happening. So it was good. All right. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap up. But just before we do, what would your words of advice be for the students? You've shared a lot of great advice and a lot of interesting thoughts and perspectives and stories. So for all these amazing students that, as you already said, they're already here networking. They're already right. here meeting other students. What would you tell them as they go off excited to go and take on new challenges? So I would tell them whatever you're interested in, just start doing research on it. And if you find something, like some field, like because there's so many fields you can go into, some field out there that's untouched that you want to do research in, just go from there. And there are endless possibilities. So just look at the world around you if you don't know where to start. Anything that you want to improve, like the ideas that you had earlier with like uh, 
with uh, Ms. Kwan were great. Like any idea that you see to improve on, just improve upon it. And even if it's improving on someone's research, because scientists do that all the time, they improve on like other people's research. So if you do that, that's another way that you can make an impact on the world. So great, amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Big round of applause. Thank you.